This is Recovery Lifestyles with Carmel. Recovery Lifestyles is committed to raising awareness and ending stigmas surrounding addiction and mental health. On today's show, I'll be speaking with Iris McAlpin, who is a transformational life and recovery coach, certified trauma professional, and mental health advocate. She founded the groundbreaking eating disorder recovery program called Beyond Recovery in 2016 and works with clients all over the world. Iris has a degree in psychology and seven years of experience as a coach. Her passion for mental health and commitment to eradicating stigma associated with mental illness are at the core of everything she does. So hi Iris, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I am just grateful that you were able to take out the time in your busy schedule and because I just feel that you have so much to offer um in the work that you do and so with that would you yeah would you like to share with the audience more about who you are maybe your story sure yeah so my name is iris mcalpin i am a recovery coach and certified trauma professional and basically what that means i work with women who are dealing with binge eating disorder and bulimia in particular and help them process trauma and recover from their eating disorders those things often go hand in hand And I've been doing that for about seven years, and I have a program called Beyond Recovery, which is a group program for women in recovery that allows people to come together and share their experiences and also get really concrete tools and practices to help them move through recovery. So that's kind of what I do. And the reason I do that is because I had bulimia for almost half of my life. and. It was really difficult for me to recover and I did a lot of the traditional treatments and they didn't help and in some cases um, they actually made things a bit worse and so I became very determined to scour the academic and spiritual literature that was out there and you know try all these different tools and techniques on myself I went to every type of healer and counselor you can think of (laughs) and amassed an arsenal of tools to really help me get better. And so now I teach people how to do that so that they don't have to go through the same ridiculously long trial and error process that I went through. Oh, I hear you what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you talk about having that, the trauma and the bulimia going hand in hand or the eating disorder and the trauma, is mm-hmm. that something um, that you see a lot? And is that directed to maybe somebody had a childhood trauma or and that almost always. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think human beings have some trauma or another in their lives, or if not like one really specific event, prolonged stress, which our nervous system actually sort of operates the same way. If you have one really traumatic event or prolonged stress, it kind of destabilizes you in the same way. And so having, you know, a lot of training and background in that definitely helps me help women that are dealing with eating disorders because those things typically co-occur. They don't always, but um, I would say nine out of 10 times there's something like that going on. Yeah, that's really, that's really fascinating because I don't think people put that two and two together, right? If you don't have a lot of information on it. And I know that, you know, everybody today, like literally everybody today is, is dealing with some sort of eating type of disorder, whether they recognize it or not. Um, Did you want to speak more to that? Yeah, it's really true. I mean, diet culture or just like the massive industry that is behind diet and weight loss products has really taught us to think that, you know, we have to look a certain way to be accepted and as social creatures for women in particular, you know, social validation is a really huge part of how we, you know, assess our self-worth. And so if we don't feel like we fit this norm, then we feel it's, it's not just about vanity. We feel this almost like existential threat that, you know, if I don't look a certain way, I'm not going to be accepted. If I'm not accepted, I can't survive. And so um, that's something that, is a really real thing that a lot of women are struggling with. And, you know, I read a statistic recently that over 90% of women are dissatisfied with their bodies. And most females these days are starting diets by the age of eight years old. Oh, wow. 
which is really heartbreaking. Um, and, and diets themselves kind of create eating disorders. And so we're sort of dealing with this epidemic and if not just, you know, an eating disorder, then disordered eating. And so it's definitely something that, um, is becoming, I think, more common rather than less common. Yeah. And I think that makes it, you know, you're talking about the statistic and that makes a lot of sense to me because, you know, by age eight, you're on social media, you're, you're on Instagram, looking at everybody's fabulous yeah. lives, right? Everybody's living yeah. this fabulous life and everybody looks perfect. <laughs> and that is a very dangerous place and space to be in. So yeah. Are you familiar with Jonathan Hyatt's work? I, I hope I'm pronouncing his last name <laughs> properly, but he talks a lot about the impact of social media on young people and the, the amount of like depression and self-harm in girls in particular has gone up exponentially since the advent of Facebook. And we can't prove causation, but what else would be causing it? Oh, for sure. I mean, I find myself, I get caught in doing it. Oh, like, yeah. I definitely, if I'm having, you know, a hard day or just wanting to even check out because I find that heading over to social media to, is a very easy way to check out, right? You don't have to think and you yeah. scroll. But what I find, and, I, and I'm getting, I know for myself, I'm getting better at catching it, but I'll be like, oh, wow, you know, look how thin she is. Oh, look how mm -hmm. big her eyes are. Look how big her lips are. Look how small her waist is, right? Right. Like, what an awful, you know. I, yeah, totally. And it happened. Yeah. I mean, it happens for so many things. People compare body size, they compare success levels or like how much fun somebody's having, but the comparison game is, is hard to avoid when you're looking at other people's lives from the sort of voyeuristic standpoint. And mm -hmm. so it's not surprising that this is causing a lot of problems. And I mean, on the flip side of that, the positive aspect of social media is that at least, you know, I feel like it's hard to say how I would have done with it because I probably would have followed some accounts that would not have been very helpful for me, but there's so much discussion now of these, you know, mental health issues that were not being discussed anywhere that I was aware of when I was dealing with depression and bulimia. And so, yeah, it's hard to say. I think it would have been very healthy for me to see, Oh my gosh, you know, I'm not the only one struggling, mm -hmm. but it's also hard to escape the comparison aspect. So, yeah, I, I, I hear what you are saying and I feel the same way a lot. I mean, 16 years ago when I was first recovering from drugs and alcohol and, you know, and then which progressed for myself as well into depression, bulimia, um, high anxiety, all of that. I feel grateful that that was not there because I don't know if I would have made it to this other side. I mean, I really not sure. Yeah. So, I, I wonder that myself. There's so much shame surrounding it and even being able to walk forward and speak. I know for myself, putting this show out there and really putting myself out there in a new way where I'm allowing, uh, I'm, al I'm talking about the things, right? I mean, I've been mm -hmm. sober for 16 years and it's only been four years uh, since I gave birth to my, my last son that we were talking earlier about yeah. that creative energy that comes when you, when you birth a baby into the world. And that is really what gave me the courage to step forward. Mm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And start speaking and start allowing and that process. Oh my gosh. You know? So I think all the time about somebody who is in early recovery and what they must be going through. And so saying that, is there anything you'd like to speak to those women and some men? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad you said that because there, there are more and more men that are experiencing it. And I think, I mean, the first step in my opinion is finding a way to get some help. Recovering is very, very, very difficult to do alone. And I, I recognize that not everybody has health insurance or health care um, or the financial means to see a professional. There are you know, 12 step programs for eating disorders that are completely free. They have online programs. Um, there are quite a few online support groups. If you go to neda.org, neda.org, there are a lot of free resources available, but I just, 
I feel strongly that if you're trying to like strong arm it and recover completely alone, Mm -hmm. it's, you're making it more difficult than it needs to be. And that is one benefit of technology. If you are really having a hard time, you know, outing yourself for lack of better terms that you're struggling with this and you don't have people in your life that you trust, then finding some online resources where you can be a little more anonymous can be a good first step. If you do have people in your life that you do trust, whether it's, you know, a teacher or a former teacher or a boss or a mentor or an aunt or an uncle or, you know, anyone, it doesn't have to be any one particular type of person, but just some responsible adult, even if you're an adult, um, that you feel like you can let in your world a little bit, it makes that shame start to come down. Yeah. The more we hide, it's like that saying that they say a lot in 12 step. It's like, we're only as sick as our secrets. And so the the more we keep things to ourselves, the more that shame has an opportunity to grow and get stronger because it tells us things like nobody will love you. If they knew nobody will accept you, you're not good enough to be, you know, seen and you're not good enough to be supported. And so if you start talking to people and you start getting that support, that little voice that's telling you that gets some of its credibility questioned, you know? Yeah. And it does get easier the more and more I think back um, to even the beginning of my journey. And I'm sure you can relate to this as well, that, you know, the first time you even wrote a blog out about something like this, or you Mm -hmm. spoke out or your first podcast, right. That you spoke out the, the, the voices that like to over that like to, you know, Um, take over sometimes every time you do it it just gets easier and easier and that's and that's where the power is yeah it is I mean it it is pretty incredible to think about because now I talk about this stuff all the time and I don't even think about it but when I first started my Instagram account where I started talking and sharing openly about the fact that I had dealt with bulimia I was absolutely terrified And when I found out that people that I actually knew in real life were following me on Instagram and like seeing that I was talking about this, I freaked out. Like it was so scary for me, but I also knew that nothing was going to change if I didn't start owning my story and people were going to continue to feel completely alone. And this was, I I can't even remember like five years ago now. Um, And now everybody's talking about it and that's great. Like I, I want people to be talking about this because it is really difficult when you feel like you're completely alone and you're the only one in the world. And I definitely felt that way. And it just made me feel like I was a freak and like completely unlovable and unfixable. And yeah. So, yeah. I know. And the other side of that is it gets comfy being there. It was. <laughs> yeah, it was in a sort of twisted way. Um, I mean, it was incredibly uncomfortable and it was incredibly comfortable simultaneously, which is kind of um, the strange thing about it. But yeah, it was, it was easier in some ways to hide than it was to let the mask down. Mm-hmm. So somebody in your position who is an eating disorder recovery coach and a trauma professional, um, and you have that uh, standard, is this something that you still struggle with? Is this something that you still every day have to do your part? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. I mean, I'll put it this way. If I'm not taking care of myself and I'm not honoring like my self care and making, you know, prioritizing the things that I know keep me at my best, those thoughts absolutely creep up. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I do believe that you can fully recover that, you know, and I think anyone who has, you know, spent years and years and years and years of their life in engaged in a pattern like that, if you're not on top of your game in terms of your self care and your mental health, um, you know, those thoughts will creep up. The difference between now and, you know, 10 years ago for me is that when I notice those thoughts creeping up, I immediately reach out and ask for help and tell everybody in my 
community, <laughs> anybody who will listen that, you know, I'm not having a good, I'm not having an easy time right now. And these thoughts are creeping up and that that's concerning to me. And so I don't try to bear the burden alone. And that makes it so much easier to work through. Whereas before I would have just kept it to myself and tried to, you know, muscle through it or like strong arm myself through it. And that usually didn't work out very well. And I would have, you know, I had a lot of relapses on the road to recovery. For sure. I think we all do. Um, And I just honor you for being that way. I think that's what attracted me to you is I could feel that you were very authentic and that you weren't going to sugarcoat it because (laughs) we're in this kind of new age where everybody seems to be a coach. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. They seem to have these fabulous lives going on, but yet behind the computer and what's really going on isn't so. And so I really, I just appreciate you. And that was part of me being so excited that you were going to be here today because uh, I was having a little bit of a, I don't know, little celebrity moment. I was like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll be the first to tell you recovery is not all roses and that yeah. feeling your feelings can be really intense and difficult, especially at first when you're used to numbing out with these other behaviors. And it takes time to learn how to ride these waves of emotion. We all, I think all human beings have an incredibly wide range of emotions. Some of us seem to experience them a little more deeply than others. I'm extremely sensitive, (laughs) very emotional. And so it's, you know, and I had a pretty significant amount of trauma. And so when you put all those things together, um, it's really no wonder that I went to bulimia and alcohol for relief to try to just like manage my ridiculous anxiety and the depression that I was feeling and all of that. And it, it, on some level, it kind of worked and it was also like very dangerous and damaging. And I still have, you know, physical effects from throwing up so much that impact me to this day. And so, you know, I, I have a lot of compassion for myself and realize that I was really struggling and that was something that kind of helped me limp along on some level, but there are much healthier ways to go about it. And so that's, you know, a lot of recovery is figuring out what are the healthy things that I can do that may not give you that quick fix, Mm -hmm. but that in the long run will allow you to experience your emotions and process them in a healthy way and not keep running away from them. So for somebody who is listening that may not understand how to have compassion and compassion for themselves, I mean, that's so huge. I know even in my own recovery, that was the turning point when I started to really have compassion and be easy on myself. Um, Because as you, I was extremely sensitive. And I remember growing Mm. up being told all the time, you're too sensitive, you know, stop crying. You're always crying, right? And it was like, I'm feeling everybody around me. Yes. (laughs) So how does somebody, and I believe as well that we attract our like, so a lot of, I know the women who listen in on this show, um, have the same experience. Where do they start? Well, one thing that can be really helpful. I mean, there's, there are a million different answers to that question because there's no right answer for where you start. You, You start somewhere. Yeah. Um, but I think one thing that can be really helpful, especially for sensitive people that have a lot of compassion for others, but have difficulty turning that around and bringing it to themselves, something that can be very, very therapeutic, and I'm a huge fan of journaling, um, is to write to yourself, you know, just sort of, you can, sometimes it can help to write out like, okay, these are the things that I'm dealing with, or these are the things that I've been through. And if you sort of ask yourself, okay, like if another woman came to me and told me that all this was going on in her life and these were all of the things that she's experienced and survived and had to deal with, yeah, how would you respond to her? What would you, how would you feel about her and start to write about that? That can be incredibly helpful because, you know, we all have the ability or I'd say like most of us have the ability to look through the lens of compassion as we talk to other people, but we have a very difficult time turning that towards ourselves and sort of externalizing like that and like writing the things down and then writing to yourself, okay, this is what 
this is how I would respond to another woman in the same situation can kind of make you say, whoa, okay, maybe I am deserving of compassion. Maybe this is really hard. Maybe, you know, I am being hard on myself and that can be a place to start. And yeah. yeah, So that's sort of what comes to mind. What I hear you saying as well is um, that can really be powerful in changing the, that tape that you play in your head, those voices, right? By actually yes. sitting down and looking at them. Because a lot of times we don't even realize what we're saying to ourselves. Oh, yeah. We, we don't. <laughs> and I, you know, I think I posted this one time. But it's like if you talk to somebody else the way you talk to yourself, they would want to smack you. <laughs> And it's true, you know, we aren't nearly as diplomatic and kind when we're talking to ourselves. And so bringing awareness to that can be really illuminating as well. And, but I think, you know, especially in the beginning when we're so accustomed to, you know, helping others or caring for others or having compassion for others, we start to just ask those questions, okay, you know, what would I do? You know, if I had a child that was struggling, how would I talk to them? Okay. Say those exact same things to yourself. If you had a friend who was going through a difficult situation, what would you recommend that she do? Would you recommend that she, you know, drink a bottle of wine and eat a pint of ice cream? Or would you like take her outside and like go for a walk? You know, okay, then maybe you should take yourself outside and go for a walk. (laughs) you know, it helps to conceptualize these things externally and then turn them back around and apply them to our own lives. Mm. So is there anything, um, we're going to start to wrap it up a little bit. Is there anything that's on your heart that you'd really would like to share today? Mm. Well, I'll just share the thing that I really feel saved my life and that is to stay curious and Mm to keep exploring new avenues, keep exploring yourself. And again, I'm a huge fan of journaling, like writing out your feelings can be incredibly cathartic and healing. And, you know, if, if you've read five books on recovery and they didn't really help you read five more or start to explore, you know, trauma, start to look into, you know, spirituality, whatever calls to you, you know, go in the direction that you feel called, but don't stop trying new things. Keep learning as much as you can. And eventually you absolutely will find tools and modalities that speak to you and that allow you to move forward. Mm. So, and if there's anyone listening that has really resonated with you and would like to look into more and reach out to you or work with you, how can they do that? Yeah. So my website is irismcalpin.com and I'm sure you can link to it somewhere. Um, you can just go to my website. My Instagram is on there. I'm very active on Instagram and my contact information is there. Articles, podcasts, all kinds of stuff. So that's the best place where you can go and start to learn more and reach out. Awesome. So yeah, I'll also have uh, your links underneath this video on the network and, um, Iris, I'm just so I'm just so grateful and I just trust that whoever is meant to hear this message today Mm. is going to hear it. And so thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you and we should continue offline sometime. (laughs) (laughs) I'd love to. Yeah.